and that ultimately mitigation is where it's at. Like we have to decarbonize our economies. Okay, but as I suggested, geoengineering has emerged onto the scene as uh, as another element of possible element of climate response. Um, and as I said at the beginning of the talk, geoengineering is generally understood as the intentional manipulation of the Earth's climate on a large scale, uh, in this case a global scale, to counteract climate change. There, geoengineering is, is also called climate engineering, so those terms are, tend to be used interchangeably. Climate intervention is another term that's been used recently. And, and generally it's divided into kind of two fundamental categories. CDR, or carbon dioxide removal, which are strategies to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and sequester it where it can't contribute to, uh, to increasing uh, the, the sort of climate forcing. Um, and solar radiation management, which involves modifying the Earth's albedo, or reflectivity, um, in order to reflect a larger proportion of solar radiation back into space, counteracting the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Okay, so if you have one force warming, solar radiation management is supposed to sort of create a you know a counter counterposing force. There are a number of different strategies um, that have been sort of brainstormed or proposed for for solar geoengineering for changing the Earth's albedo. These range from like low tech, widely dispersed strategies like painting rooftops white, like let's all go and you know, uh, when we next re-roof our houses, use light colored roofing tiles. Um, that's one strategy. Um, the strategies that are probably, you know, people have talked about space mirrors as another strategy, but I would say the, there are two strategies that are probably the leading strategies currently, um, and they are marine, marine cloud brightening, which involves increasing the reflectivity of uh, low, line, low elevation clouds over the ocean, um, and then uh, stratospheric aerosol injection, which involves uh, somehow delivering aerosols to the stratosphere to increase the scattering of light um, and increasing the albedo of, of the Earth's atmosphere in that way. Um, I'm mostly going to be focused on stratospheric aerosol injection for the purposes of this talk, which really is the technique that I think has gotten the most attention, um, the most research so far um, with respect to, to solar geoengineering. Okay, so I've already mentioned the basic principle. Um, sulfate aerosols are have been probably the most discussed approach to stratospheric aerosol injection. One reason that uh, sulfate aerosols have been appealing is because there have been, when volcanoes erupt, they, um, they deliver uh, sulfur dioxide, sulfur aerosols into the stratosphere. And we've seen from past large scale volcanic eruptions that they do have a cooling effect on the planet. So like Mount Pinatubo when it uh, erupted in the early 1990s, um, it uh, cooled the, the planet for, by about half a degree C for a year or so. Um, so Scientists have argued that they, we have sort of past kind of natural experiments that, that provide some kind of rough proof of concept. Um, though, note that volcanic eruptions are like, you know, typically sort of single point events. They're not sustained over many years or many decades, which is what would be needed to actually make solar geoengineering provide a sort of significant counterpoint to, um, to, to the warming caused by climate change. Back in 2009, the Royal Society uh, of London estimated that in one of their very uh, sort of a pivotal report on geoengineering, that maybe about a 2% reduction in solar radiation could compensate for the warming effect of a doubling of CO2. These numbers are, I would say, rough. <laughs> and the science on solar geoengineering is very much in its early stages. Okay. One of the interesting things about solar geoengineering is that, you know, if you go back to the year 2000, 
hardly anyone was taking it seriously. Like there were people, you know, sort of at the fringes, maybe thinking or talking about it, but um, they were considered out there in some sense, right? Um, from about during the last 10 to 15 years, though, um, people have started, scientists uh, concerned about climate change have started to take solar geoengineering more seriously, started to study it, uh, started to argue for it, um, at least for research on it in public forums and, and so on. And we're seeing increasing news coverage of the topic as well. So I just pulled a couple, you know, a, a, a couple headlines. Um, and within the scientific community, there's still a lot of controversy and the community of researchers who are studying solar geoengineering is pretty small, um, but it's getting a serious look from sort of mainstream scientific outlets. So there have been articles in the journal Science <coughs> and Nature, two leading global scientific uh, outlets. There was that uh, 2009 report I mentioned by the Royal um, Society. In 2015, the National Academies of Science released a, a report, a sort of two volume report on climate intervention, one of which focused on carbon dioxide removal, the other of which focused on solar geoengineering. And the National Academies of Science in the US has just launched another study uh, focused on solar geoengineering research, uh, developing a solar geoengineering research agenda and research governance strategies. Okay. Nevertheless, um, the, there's still quite a bit of controversy, even about whether research on geoengineering should proceed, and if it should proceed subject to what forms of governance and what kinds of limitations. So I was just, um, you know, uh, I'm on a geoengineering Google Groups listserv, and one of the things that came across my desk this last week was a recent uh, Intelligence Squared debate um, on the proposition, uh, engineering solar radiation is a crazy idea, right? Um, so there were uh, two folks on the left who were arguing that it is a crazy idea. Um, Clive Hamilton, who's a philosopher, and Anjali Viswa Monhanan uh, of Oxford, who's more of a policy scholar, and then David Keith, who's probably I don't know, in some sense, the global face of geoengineering. He's um, uh, a, sci a scientist at Harvard who wrote a book called The Case for Climate Engineering and has been very visibly um, involved um, in promoting, encouraging uh, research on solar geoengineering. Um, and then Ted Parsons, who's a, a legal scholar at UC, UCLA. Okay, so views on this are not settled um, and there are some important questions that solar geoengineering raises that I want to talk to you a little bit more about. So, to get at a first pass, I want to just share with you some of the arguments kind of in favor of taking this approach seriously and also some of the concerns that people have raised about it. Um, I mean, one of the central arguments in favor of taking seriously at least research on geoengineering is, um, as David Keith argues, mitigation and adaptation he says, may not be sufficient to avert um, dangerous climate change. And many people who are taking geoengineering seriously, solar geoengineering seriously, think that mitigation is not moving fast enough. Um, people, the international community has had a hard time coming to agreements. When we come to agreement, the pledges that nations are making to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions are still not enough uh, to reach the targets um, that have been set. The US just you know, recently pulled out of the Paris Agreement. So from one perspective, it looks like mitigation is not working or not working fast enough. Um, and adaptation can't really fully compensate for lack of action in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So um, some scientists argue that we could use, maybe we could use solar geoengineering to kind of buy time, right? To sort of take the peak off the global warming while human communities get their act together. 
um, and decarbonize. So maybe we could sort of suppress the peak while we make the transition away from fossil fuel intensive um, economies. Um, other people argue, in addition, that um, doing research on geoengineering could provide a sort of insurance policy or it could help arm the future, give another tool to future generations in their response to climate change. And then another element of this argument is that we're in a climate emergency. And in an emergency, you need sort of all hands on deck, all tools in the toolbox. Um, so uh, even though it may seem like a crazy idea, we should at least engage in additional research to help clarify whether solar radiation management will work and whether it's possible to do it safely and effectively. Okay, now there are also a number of arguments against or you might say concerns about uh, going down this path. Um, they include one I already mentioned that perhaps if people think that we can just use SRM to cool the planet, then we don't need to do the hard work of decarbonizing. We can all still drive our you know, fossil fuel combustion engine cars and you know, burn coal to make electricity and so on. Um, I think that would be the wrong conclusion to draw, <laughs> certainly, um, but that's, that's a worry. Um, the other thing is that SRM doesn't actually change carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. It does nothing about the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere, so it doesn't do anything to address ocean acidification associated with those elevated concentrations. There are also almost inevitably going to be unintended environmental effects. We don't really know what those effects might be. Um, some scientists have suggested that precipitation uh, patterns might change in ways that are problematic, disrupting monsoons in uh, Africa or Asia. Um, more recent models suggest, you know, maybe if it's done right, we could avoid that. Um, but the science is very uncertain. It might damage the stratospheric ozone layer, which, as we know, is uh, something that's important um, and problematic uh, if the ozone hole gets, you know, exacerbated again. Um, and really, research is in a very early stage. We don't know, for example, how crops might be affected. A recent study that came out suggested that um, the productivity of crops could be reduced. Um, where you not only reduce the amount of solar radi radiation reaching the planet, but change the, the diffusion of solar radiation under this scheme. Um, who decides? There are big, big questions about who gets to control this technology and um, who gets to decide how it might be utilized and implemented and who governs it. Okay, some people have argued that it's just ungovernable fundamentally ungovernable. Um, we might ask, could it be fairly developed and deployed? Some people argue that it could be deployed in a way that would benefit everyone. Um, but if it doesn't benefit everyone, then what? You know, would there be some form of compensation? Um, and so on. There are risks uh, potentially of rogue or unilateral geoengineering. So um, the technology you know, once developed, uh, perhaps could be used by a small number of actors, um, re one really wealthy person hoping to save the world or something like that, um, without any kind of global oversight or control. If geoengineering gets started and greenhouse gas levels continue to increase, um, then increasing levels of geoengineering would be needed in order to compensate for that. And if geoengineering were stopped suddenly, either intentionally or because of some disruption, um, you know, global war breaks out, who knows, um, there could be some, like a really rapid rebound effect uh, in the global climate system that could be quite dangerous. Um, so thinking about how to phase SRM out would be a really important element of any plan to deploy it. Some people have argued that um, this is just a buck passing strategy. This is something that kind of doesn't really address the problem and leaves it for future generations to deal with. Um, and that we're also sort of sub susceptible to a certain form of moral corruption. It sounds sort of, Steve Gardner at University of Washington argues this, that it's sort of tempting because it 
it seems like it might take the heat off, uh, no, you know, maybe pun intended, um, <laughs> you know, quickly, um, but then potentially displace the problem. Um, and then there are some people like Clive Hamilton, whose book cover is in the, the lower right there, who argues that this is just a hubristic, dominating approach uh, to the human relationship to the Earth, and not one that we should, we should pursue. OK. Um, so in the remainder of the talk, I just want to suggest that um, a couple things. One, I think it's really important that we have wide-ranging, thoughtful, deliberative conversations about solar geoengineering. And that includes about whether and how solar geoengineering research should proceed. The second point is that it's actually challenging to have those conversations um, for a number of reasons. Um, and so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Um, the current discourse around geoengineering is rife with metaphors. It's just full of them, right? Like open any newspaper, magazine, article, or even the academic literature on this topic, and you'll see lots of these metaphors. Insurance policy, plan B, solar shield, setting the global thermostat, um, playing God, superficial techno fix, okay? One of the things I wanna suggest, and I won't unpack each of these metaphors and their implications, but each of these metaphors calls our attention to sort of different aspects of solar geoengineering and, and frames solar geoengineering in a particular way. So if you think about solar geoengineering as an insurance policy, well, insurance policy sounds like, oh, that's good. That's like a backup plan, and like it, it'll sort of compensate for anything that goes wrong. There are in certain ways, perhaps, that metaphor is apt, but in certain ways that metaphor may be inapt. Similarly with plan B, right? If plan B means crossing out plan A, mitigation, then thinking about geoengineering as plan B is potentially problematic. Um, I'm gonna say a little bit more about setting the global thermostat, but you could sort of do some similar work on your own to think about like, well, what about the playing God metaphor? What does that highlight and what is that background with respect to this potential technology? One of the concerns that I have about the current discourse is that the dominant frames for thinking about and talking about geoengineering tend to be consequentialist. So if, if you've taken an ethics class, um, they tend to focus on consequences, right? Outcomes, what would happen? What are the risks? What are the benefits? What are the trade-offs? And specifically the consequences that tend to be focused on are physical climate risks, okay? Um, but there might be other consequences we could be concerned about, and maybe it's not only consequences that matter. Um, so that's one concern. The current discourse is also expert-driven um, and I would argue technocratic. Uh, some people have uh, suggested that, um, like Clive Hamilton, that basically the discourse is controlled by um, what he and others call the geo-click. Like there are a very small number of scientists who are, have a very significant role in shaping the discourse. Um, now, this is not to diminish the value of those experts' expertise, but it's to suggest that if we're thinking about a technology that has the potential to affect all seven billion plus people on the planet, plus ecosystems worldwide for not just years, but decades, probably it shouldn't be just like 20 people who are sort of controlling the, the discourse. And then unsurprisingly, because this is true of climate change discussions generally, largely, the discourse is very human-centered, not really so much focused on what this would do to ecological systems. But the worry is that this can limit the consideration of a wide range of ethical concerns. It raises worries about parochialism. Um, each of us has limitations 
in our points of view. That includes me, right? I'm not, I don't exempt myself from this. Um, but I think if we're thinking about something this complex, we need as many perspectives as possible. Um, and similarly, I would suggest that um, an inclusive approach to governance that's not exclusively centered in North America or Western Europe um, would be something that might be appropriate for a technology of this scope and magnitude. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I just have a few more things I wanna say and then I wanna open it up uh, to your questions. So one of the, th one of the um, concerns that I have um, that I've started to lay out is that the framing of geoengineering um, calls our attention to certain things and distracts us from other things. So if you think, for example, about geoengineering and you focus on different geoengineering strategies, should we do the space mirrors, should we do the reflective rooftops, marine cloud brightening, sulfates in the stratosphere, um, it really focuses us in on thinking about climate change as a technical problem. I'm not saying that there are important aspects of climate change that you know, are technical problems, right? And you all are getting trained you know, in engineering and to develop important skill sets that are going to enable us to deal with some of the technical dimensions of climate change. But what I do wanna suggest is that climate change is not only a technical problem. It's also a social problem. It's an ethical problem. It's a cultural problem. It's a political problem. It's an economic problem. And all of those dimensions of climate change are really important for us to think about. So I think it's important not to get too contained in a sort of self-reinforcing loop where we think about climate change as a technical problem. And in light of that, geoengineering looks like a great solution. And then the more we think about geoengineering, the more we think about climate change as a technical problem. So this is the stuff that might be a little controversial and you can ask me your uh, critical questions at the end. I also have a particular sort of worry about the global thermostat metaphor, which is often used in these, uh, in these discussions. Um, so people, when they're talking about governance of solar geoengineering, they say, well, who gets to control the global thermostat? And what I want to say is, who says there's a global thermostat, right? Like, it's not as if there's just, you know, where is one, right? Like an object on the wall that we can just turn up and turn down. And this metaphor, I think, misleadingly suggests that climate can be just sort of tuned in the same way that you'd, you know, ask your whatever, your Alexa, turn up the heat, turn down the heat. Or, um, so a worry that I have um, about this is that um, the thermostat metaphor will distract us or lead us to overlook the tremendous complexity involved in intentional global scale climate intervention, distract us from some of those other dimensions I mentioned, and also perhaps continue to overlook sort of the, the broader ecological effects, um, not just on humans. It's not just about making the room comfortable for, for us, um, at least in my view. Okay, so sort of thinking back, I guess, um, to the ethical framework that I laid out at the, the beginning. I'm not gonna answer the question of like, is solar geoengineering ethical or eth unethical? That's, I don't think the right question to ask, but I think one question that we should ask is how might research development and perhaps eventual deployment of SRM contribute to or hinder these goals of an ethical response to climate change? Or if you don't like these goals, um, to whatever you think would be, would constitute an ethical response to climate change. Um, so one of the things that I've been thinking about in relation to this is not just how geoengineering might affect the physical climate, but how it might affect sort of the moral climate, right? How might geoengineering affect our moral relations with one another, with future generations, and when no with non-human animals and ecological communities? Okay. Um, how might research development and deployment of SRM build or undermine 
global solidarity, which I think is it will be important to addressing climate change. Whom will it empower and whom might it disempower? Um, so those are some questions I think we should be considering. And then um, I also just want to sort of bring home the point by suggesting that pursuing solar ge geoengineering, it's not just a scientific or a technological experiment. It's also, this would also be a global social experiment. <laughs> um, and failed social experiments, if they go wrong, they can be just as risky as uh, failed technological experiments. Um, so if there, for example, if we don't figure out, if we move forward with this technology and we don't figure out a way to govern it well, then how do we prevent sort of competing, uh, you know, climate manipulators, right? Um, and Steve Gardner, whose work I really admire, um, I think has offered an important worry um, in this regard. He's, he asks, this is paraphrasing, but how likely are we to do the right thing and sort of benefit everyone with geoengineering if we've not been able to do the right thing and really take mitigation seriously in response to global climate change? Okay, so I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna basically leave it there and just say that um, I, I really like this quote um, from the UNDP uh, Human Development Report where they suggest that climate change is different from other problems facing humanity and it challenges us to think differently at many levels. Above all, it challenges us to think about what it means to live as a part of an ecologically interdependent human community. And I guess to me, it seems like that is an important message for us to keep in mind as we consider um, the wisdom of proceeding with research and, ha and, and development and how we might proceed in a way that's ethical, that's fair, that's just, and that's inclusive. All right, so I'll stop there and say happy Earth Day and thanks for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. Hello. Hello. I'll let you control the questions. Yeah, sure. No questions. You were crystal clear. You can ask me all the hard questions now. Yeah, yeah. There's quite a bit of research that's been done at the National Defense University in Europe, California places about the conflicts in the Middle East that the triggering by, by climate change and that seems to be touching on the whole plethora of the ethical, the political and economic issues they discuss. What are your thoughts on exactly how climate change in today's world work? What, what role does it play in adding to the instabilities in places like the Middle East? Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, I, I, that's a difficult question, um, and one that probably a political scientist would be better positioned to answer than a, than a moral philosopher. But um, I mean, I guess, I think climate change, I mean, if you think about what causes conflict, right? Um, conflict often arises under conditions of stress, right? Like if there's plenty of, you know, if you got a bunch of kids in a room and there's plenty of cupcakes to go around, then everybody gets a cupcake, everyone's happy, right? If there's, you know, 10 kids and there are only four cupcakes, right? We have a, con <laughs> we have a condition of stress and conflict is gonna, you know, break out. So I think one of the things that um, climate change does is it adds various forms of stressors, um, you know, in different, you know, in different shapes and forms in different places. Um, but I think we're already seeing, right, like with increasing drought stress or you know, less arable land, um, places that are becoming uninhabitable, and people who are needing to migrate to to new find new homes because literally they can't. Um, I think. There is a strong relationship between, potential relationship between climate change and, and conflict. And I guess what I was trying to sort of circle back to solar geoengineering, one of the worries that I've had about solar geoengineering is that um, you know, we have pretty fragile 
solidarities um, around efforts to address climate change. I mean, we've been talking about this, you know, the, 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 the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in the early 90s. We've been talking about this for a long time now, multiple decades, and we're just sort of barely getting to, to points of agreement and consensus. So, um, so I do think as we move forward, we need to think carefully about the potential for solo geoengineering to, you know, either build or undermine those solidarities. If yeah. I may, of course. I've looked into the research on climate change and the conflict in Syria in particular, hmm. and there's definitely a clear link between the two. And uh, we don't want to be too reductionist in saying that climate change caused the war in Syria. Mm -hmm. Wars are two, you know, are big projects mm -hmm. and are rarely caused by one thing. Yes. And but there's definitely a close. There's I mean, climate change definitely played a key role in triggering the war in Syria. Mm -hmm. And I can go into a lot more details. Yeah. But let me share with you an anecdote. Uh, I'm part of a project I've interviewed uh, a whole, uh, you know. Uh, many, many families, refugee families, mm. uh, Syrian refugee families mm. in Lebanon. Mm. And a few of them happen to be from the Raqqa region. The reg Raqqa is, you may recall, the former capital of the so-called uh, ISIS uh, mm -hmm. group. Mm -hmm. And these farmers from that region told me that even if the war stops, even if there is peace and tranquility in that region, we <laughs> cannot go back because the land has been giving less and less. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. that happens to be in the transition, climatic transition zone between mm -hmm. arable land and the desert. Mm -hmm. So they were the f one of the first to feel the mm -hmm. direct impact mm -hmm. of climate change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they are technically mm -hmm. more than just war refugees, they are climate refugees. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, and that is becoming, you know, an increasing topic of attention and scholarly study um, because where you know obviously there are huge conflicts over migration um, already um, you know globally um, and these are anticipated to be exacerbated under climate change so yeah thanks for that helpful comment yeah yeah Go ahead. Um, in, in your opinion so the geo click I'm so fascinated by that. <laughs> um, in your opinion like how successful has the scientific and engineering community this geoengineering community been at kind of asking itself the tough questions. Um, like how successful or unsuccessful are they? Are they good at interrogating themselves or do they need like philosophers coming in to knock on the window and be like, hey. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I guess I would say all of us need somebody to come in and knock on the window <laughs> and say, hey, you know, I mean, I think, um, you know, each of us has certain assumptions that we sort of take for granted that may not be apparent to us. Um, and so I do think that, the, the, you know, if you want to call them that, I mean, they might not appreciate it, but you know, the, the geo click or the folks who have been most heavily invested in these conversations and, and in moving the research forward. I mean, I do think most of those folks, um, you know, David Keith is one who's been out front and center. I get to actually, I'm on a panel with him at MIT on Thursday, so wish me, wish me luck. Um, but, um, you know, he very much attends to, you know, acknowledges that this is not just a technical issue, that it's an ethical issue. Um, nevertheless, I guess I still feel like um, the discourse needs to be broadened. I don't really trust, you know, I don't really trust academics. So, you know, I think there should be public conversations about this to, to figure it all out. It's not like moral philosophers have some kind of God's eye view where we can just say, oh, like, this is the answer, you know, end of story, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that is increasingly being recognized, and I think that's encouraging, is um, th that a kind of, you know, linear model where like the scientists sort of figure out how to do it and then society decides whether to do it, that mm -hmm. that's really not 
a particularly good model. I mean, it may not be a great model generally, but for something like this, where the kind of value assumptions, um, the sorts of things that people are concerned about um, are diverse, um, having people involved, you know, other than just the scientists from the get-go can be really valuable. Yeah. yeah. You had mentioned that um, the injection of aerosol, um, most of the people that are leading this idea or debating the idea have the view of consequentialism. Uh -huh. I was wondering what other ethical point frameworks yeah. might like, perform better uh -huh. in, the, in this, this <clears throat> talk. Yeah. Um, well, I, okay. Mm. I'm a little hesitant to just sort of say, oh, virtue ethics would be better, or if you've studied ethics, or deontology would be better, right? Uh, because I think, I mean, the way I think about ethical theories is a sort of lenses, you know, and that there's no one lens that's going to really enable us to see sort of all aspects of an issue. So we should be thinking about consequences, right? Like it would be crazy not to, but that might not be the only thing that we should be thinking about. So I mean, I do think like somebody like Clive Hamilton, who argues that this is sort of a hubristic approach, like he is sort of thinking from a more virtue ethics kind of lens, right? Um, you know, there are others who think just maybe categorically, like this is sort of, you know, a, a line we shouldn't cross or something like that. So, but I also want to suggest, so I don't really have a, an answer except that I think we should be very pluralistic. And I also think that uh, we shouldn't restrict ourselves to sort of standard Western moral theory, okay? Like there are people throughout the world who, you know, all of whom have a stake in this and um, all of those ideas should, should, should be considered and discussed um, to the extent that they can be, yeah. Hopefully not Latin nihilism. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is the challenge, right? Like, when you bring in, you know, if you're going to embrace pluralism and diversity, right, then people ask, well, what about the people who are climate deniers, right? What about, you know, and um, that's a challenge, and I think um, that's, responding to that challenge is complex. I think deliberative dialogue is helpful. I also think it's helpful to be able to distinguish sort of sincere from disingenuous um, positions. And it, in some cases, climate denial is, I think, not coming from a position of sincerity. It's coming from a position like with corporate climate, de corporate funded climate denial from uh, a position of sort of vested interests. And yeah, so, that's a great question, yeah. Anything else? I think you were waiting, yeah, so I should. Waiting. Yeah, so I should go there first, and then I can go to the back. Uh, a couple of years ago, I heard the journalist Naomi Klein give a talk about this. Mm. And, um, it's really trenchant critique, and yeah. uh, brings up a lot of things you mentioned. And she says um, as well that this sort of that we're locked into this narrative of thinking that technical solutions are always going to solve the problems, mm -hmm. even if course they can help solve the problem mm -hmm. but um, one of the things she urged the audience was like you know why don't you think outside these narratives we're locked into it's mm -hmm. if, if we all empower ourselves as storytellers we might actually mm -hmm. be able to think a little differently in mm -hmm. terms of narrative so I was wondering um, as a moral philosopher <laughs> um, have you found this problem to like you know exceed some of your own categories of training like mm -hmm. your own like how, as a philosopher, do you reconcile this with what you've been taught to right. analyze with? Yeah. And you break out of the narratives that even as an academic, you're supposed to analyze these problems with. Right, yeah. Um, it seems like you're suggesting that, you thought about that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think one way, um, you know, I didn't focus on it in this talk, but one of the things I've been um, thinking about, it, so I've been sort of stepping back from trying to make like, you know, sort of a norm normative statements on like, you know, is this good or is bad or, you know, and, and thinking more about like how, 
um, might it be possible to approach this issue in a way that's genuinely inclusive? So what frameworks for thinking about justice, for example, take seriously the need to give voice to multiple perspectives, multiple narratives? Um, and so I've been thinking about justice as recognition um, and some of the work by Nancy Fraser on that idea. Um, and looking, thinking also about the way in which the current discourse allows in or marginalizes different voices and what might be, you know, what might be done about that. So, um, so yeah, I do, you know, I guess another thing I would say is that I've learned a lot from sort of, I have a colleague uh, at Michigan State, Kyle White, who's an indigenous, he's a, uh, uh, scholar, uh, activist, um, who has written a bit, a few things on geoengineering, and you know, taking up his perspective really has sort of, he really does have a different angle on it, you know, um, that that has provoked my thinking in a different way. You know, he says like indigenous communities aren't really think talking a lot about it geoengineering, and they're the reason they're not talking about it is because for them it's a bizarrely sort of niche issue <laughs> like that you, if you're really gonna like indigenous communities should have input but if they're gonna be invested in engaging in the dialogue geoengineering can't be disconnected from other concerns that indigenous communities have like the dispossession of their land you know and histories of injustice that they've faced and so on. So that's one, you know, that's one example. Yeah. There was one question in the back. I don't know. Yeah. So um, it feels to me like this is one question that parallels a number of other questions that face society today, right? So where technology outpaces our knowledge. Yeah. Um, and so if you were to ask me about biological engineering, think genetic engineering of mosquitoes, for example, mm -hmm. um, or say 3D printing where materials and design and things like that, can, you know, where you can essentially, a very small group of people mm -hmm. can cause global mm -hmm. um, yeah. change. So I'm, yeah. I'm sort of curious, it feels to me like the moral framework for this needs to be broader. Mm -hmm. And climate change is just one example. Yeah. And I'm, I'm unfortunately fairly cynical about human nature because I always feel like we can decide what the right thing to do is and then people will ignore it. Uh, you know, so we can talk about what yeah. it's right to do human genetic engineering on human right. beings. Right. And people can all agree that it might be wrong, but they will choose to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Wealthy people will manipulate mm -hmm. the genes of their children. I, I, I hate to say this, but I guarantee it will happen. Because they will all say, it's wrong in general, but it's okay for me. Mm -hmm. Because I'm special and my needs outweigh the needs of everybody mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. And I feel like at some mm -hmm. point we have to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. Think about all of these in that context. Because mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you know, again, whether it's right or it's wrong is really valuable to talk about, but unfortunately, I sort of suspect that it would happen anyway, and so maybe the question is how do you yeah. think about that? And right. What you do? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot to say there. I mean, I, I think you're right that there are many other issues that have, you know, not an identical structure, but where there are parallel things going on. And I think sometimes, you know, with respect to say human engineering, right, human enhancement, you know, genetic engineering and so on, I think sometimes people think, oh, well, even if, you know, a few rich people do that, that's sort of their choice and it's kind of independent from, you know, it's, it's unlike geoengineering in that geoengineering is making a choice for the whole planet, but in this case, it's just, but I think what you're pointing out is that there are actually more parallels than divergences there and what you know, a, some people do actually does have an impact on you know, everyone else in a lot of ways. So I guess I would, would agree with you there. Now, what do we do about that? Like, you know, it's sort of like, um, what do we do about the fact that people, you know, don't always act ethically or, you know, frequently don't or power is more important than ethics and politics? I mean, I don't think there's, like, that's a, like, a fundamental perennial question and I don't um, have a really easy answer to that. I guess I would say, you know, 
with respect to solar geoengineering, I think it's so clearly like a global scale technology that affects everyone and everything that we have kind of a unique opportunity to try and develop governance structures, research approaches that are more integrative than um, in other arenas. And then ideally, you know, maybe those could be trans transferred to some of those other areas. But ca can you control individual, you know, very powerful or very wealthy people um, and what they do? It's, you know, it's hard. You know, what about a small nation that is disproportionately affected? Geoengineering in theory is relatively inexpensive. Right, yeah. Would it be wrong if your own country is, is you know, yeah. like off the face of the earth to say, I choose to make this choice to save my people and my country, right? Yeah. You know, it's a, yeah. that's, no, I mean, yeah, I think that's, you know, that's some of the complexity and some people argue like David Keith has been arguing that actually the one of the most compelling reasons to engage in geoengineering is to, as he puts it, save the global poor, right? Like that this would be the, the, the fastest way to sort of alleviate some of the near term uh, impacts of climate change. But I think it's pretty complicated. Um, and I, I think what you're pointing, one of the things I think that is important to keep in mind in terms of the context is that like there's a whole geopolitical context to this. So right, one nation, one small nation trying to, you know, save their climate. I mean, if that's not in, in the interests of the more powerful nations, I mean, nations like the US have a lot of power, um, generally. <laughs> and therefore a lot of power going into discourses about, you know, and uh, decisions about geoengineering. I think one of the fundamental questions is like, might we be willing to share some of that power? Um, and how, and what might that look like? Yeah, I know. I, I, is there anyone else who has a question that I haven't answered before I take a second question? Any other students or anything? No, okay, yeah, and then I, I, I also don't wanna, uh, overstay um, my time. So, as yeah. somebody who's like really nerves out about framing, yeah, um, I just was curious if, and I loved the list that you had up there of like some of these really problematic frames around this conversation. I was wondering if you've stumbled upon any frames that you feel like are particularly good or particularly uh -huh. useful, yeah, um, or are they pretty much all <laughs> <laughs> sort of reductionist? And yeah, I mean, regret. yeah, I'm, I mean, I think my there's not going to be any one perfect frame because every frame you know some stuff gets in the frame and some stuff's outside of the frame so i think multiple frames are helpful and then you know uh there's a guy named rob bellamy who's written on some of the social science side of this and he talks about unframing right like trying to sort of break open the frames um to provide more discursive space um, and so like one of the things that he suggests is that in, in some of the I mean so one of the problems with framing is it actually makes deliberative discourse difficult right because if I'm talking so say I'm a social scientist I want to set up a deliberation about this with people who know who've never heard about geoengineering how do I introduce that to them how do I introduce that to them in a way that doesn't sort of presuppose certain things. Um, so Bellamy has argued that like one of the problematic framings is just saying, here's what geoengineering is. Like we have a climate emergency. Because we have a climate emergency, we should take geoengineering seriously. Here are six different ways of doing it. Which do you think are, you know, which way do you think is best? He's like, wow, that really narrows people's attention to just choosing among a menu of geoengineering options. So unframing would be sort of thinking about climate change and climate responses more broadly. Yeah. All right, well, I think that's probably a good place to stop. I'm happy to chat individually with anyone. Um, yeah.